The history of the knowledge of the Earth around the Sun is well known, and uh, starting in the 1400s, 1500s, people were figuring out the motion of the Earth. In Copernicus, he figured out that uh, the Earth was definitely moving and uh, figured out a bunch of things that, that was contrary to geocentrism, which was a prevailing idea at the time. They knew the Earth was a globe, but they thought it was stationary and in the center of the solar system or really in the center of the universe. But Copernicus is like, I don't think so. Galileo similarly said that doesn't make sense. And he had some very specific things that he had identified, like the phases of Venus. So the phases of Venus were coincided with how big Venus appeared to us. And so as we know about perspective, when things are close, they're larger, they appear larger. And when they're far, they appear smaller. Okay, one last time. These are small, but the ones out there are far away. So he had sketched out in his journal, it's page 217 of the, of the book, that, that he drew out the phases and the size of Venus that, that he saw. And, and it's amazing how accurate it is because when we look at modern, you know, rigorous measurements of it, we see that it completely matches. So he got it right, just drawing it by hand and kind of getting that to scale, right? He's looking through a, a, a telescope and then just, you know, rough writing drawing how big they were. But because of the phases of Venus, he's like, it could not be that geocentrism, that everything's going around the earth. It does not make sense. And he also identified that the moons of Jupiter were orbiting Jupiter and that there's a relationship there in, in that orbit. And he said, well, if the moons of Jupiter are orbiting, then other things must be following the same pattern. It makes sense. Uh, then you come to the late 1600s and Oli Romer was, was measuring the, the time that the moon Io of Jupiter, one of the moons that uh, Galileo had identified, how, what time it went into the shadow of Jupiter when it was occulted by Jupiter's shadow. And they knew very precisely what time it would happen. And so he, he measured that when he was, when the sun Sorry, when the Earth was near Jupiter in its orbit around the Sun. And then he also measured it later when the Earth was farther away from Jupiter. Not quite the opposite because the Sun would be in the way. But he identified that it was late by several minutes. And that did a couple things. That confirmed that the, that the speed of light is not infinite. And it also confirmed that the distance had changed dramatically. So big, big uh, idea there that, that has, that really doesn't have any, any explanation in, in other, other ideas, right? It, it, it really ruined a whole bunch of other thoughts about it. So anyway, then in the early 1700s, James Bradley, 1725, uh, he had, he was looking for something that had been postulated or hypothesized about Earth's orbit. If we are on uh, either side of the sun, then near far, near stars should appear to shift slightly in reference to very, very far stars. We call that parallax. Hold up your finger, open and close one eye, and you can see that your finger moves back and forth in relation to things behind you. And that was what he was looking for, but he didn't find that. What he did is he mounted a telescope in a chimney in a house, pointed almost straight up, and he, he was able to, to sight in on some stars that were near straight up. And he, he every, you know, every couple days, couple days over the course of uh, time, he identified that the star moved. Not just the one star, all stars moved very slightly. And his telescope that he was using was precise enough to about one arc second. And he noticed that it measured about a 20 arc second wide uh, ellipse. Well, turns out that all stars do that. And it depends where they are in the celestial sphere. Stars that are at the north or south of the celestial sphere do a circle. And the stars that are on the equator of the celestial sphere do a line. And everywhere in between, they do an ellipse. 
and the ellipse gets wider and wider as it's farther north or south. And that was figured out to be because of aberration, which is the motion of the Earth in relation to the motion uh, of light. That light has a certain speed and the Earth has a certain speed. And that 20 arc second that he measured is a composition of the speed of the Earth in relation to the speed of light. So as, as the Earth was moving around the sun, the stars that were in the north, which was what he could see, he couldn't see to the south because the globe's in the way, that as we're moving around, those stars shifted in position because the light came in at an angle. Like if you have an umbrella and you're standing in the rain and there's, say there's no wind, right? You're standing there and then you start walking. That rain that hits, that would get caught by the front of the umbrella will hit the front of your pet leg. And the faster you move, the more of your body will get caught. Also, say that there's wind and you're standing still. Well, you'd have to tip the umbrella forward. <clears throat> so that's how, that's what aberration is, is doing there. So that's related in a north south in the celestial sphere way. And then, uh, in the 1800s, late 1800s, we had, uh, well, mid 1800s, we did have a confirmation of that parallax we were looking for. It was 1839 by Friedrich Bessel, where he measured the parallax of star 61 Cygni, and he measured it to be 0.314 arc seconds. Now, James Bradley's telescope wasn't quite um, precise enough to measure that, but Bessel had you know, it was a, more than a hundred years. They had uh, progressed the technology and they were better able to measure that parallax. But if he hadn't measured it, this is cool. This is what you see in science all the time. People do, they, they get the, they get credit for that seminal observation, that seminal experiment, but they're not the only one. Other people were doing it at the same time. So you've got Thomas Henderson, a Scottish astronomer, uh, Bessel is German, a Scottish astronomer just Shortly after Bessel, he measured the parallax of Alpha Centauri. He measured it to be point, uh, let's see, 1.16 arc seconds, which was a little bit off. It's been later improved to be 0.747 arc seconds. And then that was in January of, of 39, he published that. And then later in 19, did I say, what did I say? 1839 is the year. Later in November of 1839, um, Thomas Henderson also measured the parallax of Sirius, which he, he measured to be 0.23 arc seconds, later been um, improved to 0.379 arc seconds. So in the mid, or prior to the mid 1800s, parallax had been measured. And of course, that's because the Earth moves a significant distance between its, its orbit on either side of the orbit in relation to the near star and the far stars. And then, um, let's see, he, he, um, Henderson also measured a whole bunch of Southern stars in, uh, 1842. So all of this was, was, uh, excellent confirmation that the earth is orbiting the sun. Now, though, the one more, before we get to the 1900s and really the technology started taking off, you got Vogel and Schneier and Vogel and Schneier, are more Germans, they measured the, the color of light and specifically the shift in the color of light. So as your, uh, as the earth is moving towards stars that are on the, the, the plane of the celestial sphere, we're going straight toward those stars and we're moving toward them at a certain velocity. So the Doppler shift of light would say that, that there should be a slight, um, uh, change in color. In, in fact, it should shift slightly blue, it should increase the, the, the frequency. And then six months later, as we're moving away from those stars at the speed of our orbit around the sun, there should be a slight Doppler shift. It should be slightly redder. And so it's constantly changing throughout the year for stars. And the cool thing is that you've got stars in different directions that are changing and shifting at different times of year. So if somebody's like, oh, well, they're all changing. Well, no, they're not all changing. They all change differently based on where they are in the celestial sphere. And to really put a, a, a dampener on anybody who, who thinks who's going to try to come up with some sort of excuse, the stars in the north and south of the celestial sphere 
don't experience any of this because we're not moving toward or away. They're up here. We're, we're not generally moving any closer or farther from them. Our velocity to them, toward them, is essentially zero. So the cool thing about that is you've got, you've got parallax, you've got aberration, and you've got color shift. And those three together are all separate lines of evidence that, that uh, confirm that the Earth is moving, and they all show sh effects that are uh, opposite each other, not opposite, but like aberration and color shift are orthogonal to each other. So the motion is very important and, and into it, taking into account there. So it, it all works together to help us know that the Earth is in fact moving around the sun.